Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to participate in our word cloud if you've not already. Um, you can follow the instructions at the top of the screen or click on the link in the chat. Um, if you post it in the chat, your answer, we won't see that on the word cloud on the screen. So please uh, go to the link. Thank you. Good morning, distinguished delegates, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to uh, this meeting on the protection of civilians. And uh, this is the kickoff meeting for the protection of civilians uh, week here at the UN. Uh, we'll have a large number of really uh, important and interesting meetings to discuss various aspects of this essential mandate of the United Nations. Um, today we'll be discussing unarmed uh, approaches to the protection of civilians in, in UN peacekeeping. Um, and you can see that we have the word cloud um, in front of us. Um, I, whoever's managing the word cloud, it's actually gone from the screen at the moment, so I'm unable to um, uh, comment on it. Uh, there, thank you. So you see these are some of the, the ideas and um, and uh, uh, associations that people have with regards to uh, protection. And you can see there some of the associations include physical protection, the use of military, human rights being very important, the use of force being very important, safety, security. Um, I see there the idea of vulnerability, um, blue helmets, uh, importantly, uh, dialogue, but also failure, uh, the concept of imminent threat, so these are all important ideas, I think, which will surface in the context of our discussions today. I see community as well, and dialogue, uh, humanitarian law. So uh, these are all really uh, very important and um, I think they'll continue to grow and shape as we have our discussion uh, uh, today. And so welcome you and, and would ask you to continue to participate in the work cloud if you, if you haven't already. Uh, during our session today, a few uh, housekeeping notes. First of all, to introduce myself. My name is David Hyrie. I'm the Director for, Pol for Policy Evaluation and, and Training Division in the Department of Peace Operations. And we have a protection of uh, civilians uh, team of colleagues. Um, I want to particularly mention Regina Fitzpatrick, who's been key to organizing uh, this alongside colleagues and, um, and uh, friends from the United Kingdom mission. Uh, to the United Nations, uh, the permanent mission of Uruguay to the UN, uh, the permanent mission of the Republic of, of Indonesia uh, to uh, the UN. Um, a few housekeeping points this morning. Please uh, keep your microphone uh, muted when you're not speaking. Uh, you have a raise hands uh, function or a chat during the Q&A and um, kindly put your video on uh, when you're speaking. And, um, and lastly, that this session uh, is going to be uh, recorded. Uh, we have a number of, of, uh, of fantastic speakers today um, and panelists uh, that we really look forward to uh, to engaging with and encourage all of all of you in the audience uh, to engage uh, with them as well. Um, let me uh, start at the outset by thanking our, our co-hosts, um, the United Kingdom and, uh, and Indonesia uh, for, for co-hosting us. Um, and I'm going to um, say a few more words after our introductory speakers, but let me begin at the outset um, by, giving, uh, by giving them the floor. We're very privileged to have with us today Ambassador James Roscoe, who's the Deputy Permanent Representative of uh, the UK Mission to the United Nations, um, and Ambassador Mohamed K. Koba, who is the Charge d'Affaires of the uh, Indonesian Mission to the UN. Uh, so let me first, uh, for the introductory remarks, hand the floor to Ambassador Roscoe. Ambassador, the floor is yours. I'm not hearing Ambassador Roscoe come on. Um, Sorry. I have the wrong link, but I'm here now. Great. 
Thank you, Ambassador Roscoe. Good to see you. Good morning. And um, uh, in fact, you've arrived just in time because I had just asked uh, uh, if you would kindly take the floor to give us a few opening remarks and then I'll pass the floor to Ambassador uh, Mohamed K. Koba. So over to you. Great. Many thanks, Indy, David and Dunn. Good morning to everyone um, and particularly to you, but also to Ambassador Koba and Councillor um, Beretta. And thank you um, to all of you for your support and commitment to this agenda and also for bringing us uh, together for this, um, for this event. Um, I also want to say um, a big hello, but also our thanks to SRSG, Kesa um, and to the panel of experts for joining us today. Um, we're here because it's over 20 years since we began mandating peacekeeping missions and operations to protect civilian populations and you know, early protection of civilian mandates recognize the necessity um, for direct action and the use of force um, to afford protection to civilians under imminent threat of physical violence. But of course, protection of civilians has become a central concept of peacekeeping and its use and that concept itself has grown um, because almost concurrent with those first mandates, um, that limited scope that peacekeepers had to protect um, and to provide physical protection meant it needed to combine that approach with more um, creative solutions. Um, and I saw this myself a lot when I was posted in Sierra Leone um, in 2004, 2006, where it was clear that um, you know, the, the physical protection that, um, that a military presence could provide um, was only the, um, the baseline, um, was only the sort of the fundamental. And on top of that, you had to build these other responses as well, all essentially unarmed, um, which came with the additional purpose uh, and promise of outcomes, which could be sustained um, as the peacekeeping operations um, departed. So when we look at protection of civilians, I think we have to really consider the full range of tools and capabilities available um, to prevent and to respond to, to threats. Um, we know, of course, that the military component must provide a credible deterrent. And often where it doesn't provide that credible deterrent, um, we can't even begin to embark on these other elements um, because you need that security. Um, but we also recognize um, that a whole of mission approach implemented by civilian and police and military peacekeepers um, ensures that civilians are not only protected from physical violence, but also provided with a protective, sorry, with, with the space rather for, um, for mediation and for, for that dialogue that is so essential to sustaining peace in the long run. Um, now in MINUSMA at the moment, which is mandated to use all means necessary to ensure the protection of civilians in immediate danger of physical violence. The UK has currently, um, ha has currently deployed a long range reconnaissance group, um, which is providing a high capability commitment, um, enabling intelligence led operations across MINUSMA's mandated tasks. And I, I just encourage anyone who isn't to try and follow them on Twitter because they put up some really interesting stuff showing how they're getting into communities and engaging with communities um, and how that intelligence from communities is also um, often providing them with the, um, the intelligence they need um, to go and pursue um, other armed actors out there. Um, so we're really proud to have made this contribution and today we'll hear um, from Mohamed um, Alamin, the head of the office of MINUSMA um, on the types of unarmed protection activities um, they're undertaking. Um, including early warning and rapid response, and working closely with UNPOL and the justice team um, to address impunity and strengthen the rule of law. Um, but we want peacekeeping missions to lead to long-term sustained peace and stability. There's no point having them unless they're doing that. Um, and armed operations and armed approaches to protection of civilians alone just can't achieve this. Um, so if we are to support the effective transition from peacekeeping missions to sustaining peace, we have to recognize how effectively 
um, to use those unarmed approaches. This is not just a task for our peacekeeping missions. It relies on the support of our UN country teams and a range of other actors in country. So it's for this reason um, that we've supported um, the upcoming report. Um, and I really look forward to continuing um, this important conversation with you today. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and for reminding us of uh, the very important ways in which uh, uh, peacekeeping missions work, both using military and unarmed means, and the, the, the important range of partnerships they need to, to link into. And I think all of those are themes which uh, I, I have no doubt will surface uh, further as the discussion continues. Um, let me also, uh, and thank you also for, for the, the uh, support and the organizational uh, um, support which the United Kingdom has given to, to this important effort. Let me now uh, pass the floor for introductory remarks to uh, Ambassador Mohammed K. Koba. Um, and uh, and uh, Ambassador, the, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Excellencies, distinguished participants, a very good morning. I thank each and every one of you for being here with us today. Uh, together with the UK, Uruguay, and the UNDPO, we are proud of uh, to co-host this important event to kick off the uh, Protection of Civilians Week 2021. We are very pleased to be able to welcome all of you who have been very active on the Protection of Civilians, as well as those of you who show a strong interest on the discourse of the UN peacekeeping. I'm confident that today's discussion would be very enriching for many of us. Uh, to prevent and respond to the threat to civilians, the UN peacekeeping operations need to leverage the full range of available tools and capabilities through an integrated and comprehensive approach. It definitely includes the significance of unarmed approaches to protect civilians. We believe that this comprehensive approach should be strategic, politically driven and people-centered to complement the use of force and merit recognition for the essential role of peacekeepers for sustaining peace on the ground. Today, I'm also proud of presenting one of the panelists, Lieutenant Colonel Ratih Pusparini, to show that a sustainable approach to POC must be grounded in community engagement and must support community-led protection strategies. As stipulated in the Security Council Resolution 2538-2020, uh, she will share her experiences on the importance of full, effective, and meaningful participation of uniform and civilian women in peacekeeping operation uh, can contribute to more effective community engagement. I believe that all of you will have a fruitful discussion this morning. Excellencies, distinguished participants, without further ado, I'll let you, David, to take note of our panel. Uh, thank you and have a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, and uh, we're really grateful again for uh, the co-hosting and support of, uh, of the Permanent Mission of Indonesia. And we'll also hear at the closing remarks from Councillor Beretta of the Permanent Mission of Uruguay, uh, who we also thank for, for co-hosting us. Um, let me turn then now to um, uh, the next uh, portion of the, the morning's events. Um, just to check, uh, the, let's check in with the, um, uh, the word cloud and see what's happening uh, with that as we go forward. Um, we're seeing, I think, still the same important uh, emphasis placed on the use of force and the military which is interesting, but also human rights and physical protection. And I think um, what will be interesting today is to also hear, I think, from our panelists on, on unarmed uh, uh, methods of protection and uh, to see some of those other areas which are, are figuring, perhaps slightly smaller words, but community engagement. I see women dialogue, um, the question of children, uh, humanitarian law, uh, as Ambassador Koba, you mentioned uh, the importance of a comprehensive approach. I right, see that there and protecting environment. So uh, it's a very comprehensive uh, a set of challenges which our missions must, must, uh, must face. And um, I think the panel uh, that we have today 
reflects that uh, uh, that range of uh, of uh, of um, of requirements. But first, we'll hear from someone who is uh, imminently well qualified to tell us about the challenges of managing a comprehensive approach. Um, we're very lucky to have uh, the special representative of the Secretary General, Madame Bintu Keita, uh, who's leading uh, the MONUSCO mission in, in the DRC uh, with us today. Um, I think uh, she probably needs no introduction uh, to you as uh, former Assistant Secretary General in the Department of, of Peace Operations here in New York. Um, uh, she's uh, currently facing uh, the multiple challenges which MONUSCO faces daily, but um, compounded um, by uh, the, vol the volcano in, uh, in Goma. And I understand she may therefore not be able to spend all of the time this morning with us, which is understandable. Um, but let me give the floor now um, with a very warm welcome uh, to uh, SRSG uh, Keita. Good morning to you. Or good afternoon to you. Thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for this introduction. And uh, uh, thank you also for uh, bearing with me if I have to step out, because uh, we are really uh, managing uh, multiple uh, threats uh, in Goma. It's uh, the volcano eruption, but it's also the aftershock with the uh, tremors, and they are quite heavy. Uh, so um, you will bear with me if uh, I just have to disappear. Um, but uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, this uh, uh, conversation. I think it's, uh, it's a good one because we really have to anchor everything we do into reality and checking with each other what it is that we are talking about. So I welcome this uh, uh, event on unarmed approaches to protection of civilians in United Nations peacekeeping. So uh, ambassadors uh, uh, from the UK, James Rosco, and uh, from Indonesia, uh, Koba, as well as uh, uh, Uruguay. Uh, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have the name uh, here in front of me, uh, but just to say, um, distinguished representative of permanent missions and member states, dear David and dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by thanking our, the co-host, the permanent missions of Indonesia, the United Kingdom, and Uruguay to the United Nations, as well as the colleagues in DPO. And it's a real pleasure to see all of you. It's almost three months I've left uh, uh, New York and uh, for organizing this uh, side event on unarmed approaches to protection of civilians in United Nations peacekeeping. Um, going to try to be short because I have two messages that I want to, to, to pass. Uh, so the, in this short introduction to our discussion, I would like to make two points. First, it is true, uh, operational protection from imminent threat of violence under chapter seven of the charter is often, very often, the sole point of reference for the Security Council providing the authorization for our troops to use force, and this was referred again in the cloud, um, and if, if and when necessary. Yet, our missions, and I think it was covered in the introductory remarks, civilian personnel have always been working politically at local, national, and regional levels to support the protection agenda. Since, as we know, the best protection is both the prevention and the durable solution of deadly conflicts. Moreover, the defense of human rights, again, one key word which was bold in the cloud, uh, mind cloud, and the facilitation of humanitarian access for our agencies, funds, and program is also central to our missions, which continue to invest heavily in unarmed approaches to increase their effectiveness and efficiency. Second, increasingly in conflict environment, which are not clear cut, and this is the DNA of the 21st century. Years ago, decades ago, we had the troops in one side and the troops in another side. Now we are talking about asymmetric environment and threats. 
where the threats of civilians of armed groups involved in criminal activities. So it's not just a regular army confronting another one. And where the state is still unable to restore the authority, its authority of the large territories, we also need to support other modalities of protective interventions, basically empowering, and this is where I go straight, and it was said also before, empowering communities to protect themselves and without weapons. So this is this is this is quite a proposed a proposition because we we've seen in the mind cloud force security and its blue helmets and it's a number of other things. Right? Uh, so this is all the more important to me that in peacekeeping environments where a mission is engaged in a drawdown or an exit strategy, transitioning to a different type of United Nations support to a host country, largely managed by agencies, funds, and programs. And I think Ambassador Koba touched on this one, but where low intensity conflicts and insecurity persist. So it's not when we, we are withdrawing that everything is fine, far from it. So as a first point, more investment in unarmed approaches than is usually known. This is my proposition. In the past few years, our missions have significantly increased the investment in unarmed approach to protection of civilians, notably by supporting the rebuilding of state institutional capacities, but also by focusing on communities. A key aspect determining the effectiveness of the protection of civilians is the ability to place those civilians that we are mandated to protect at the center. And I insist at the center of our approaches. And this is also one key message of the action for peacekeeping. People-centered approach to whatever we do. Civilians, individuals, and communities are not only subjects but also, and this is important to me, agents of protection. So in other words, we should not be just looking at the people on the ground, the communities and the population as just the recipient of something. They themselves have also the ability empowered to do something about their own protection. But for this, it means that we really have to, uh, to, to shift the gear and the mindset on how we approach them, which means also respect for the population themselves and the communities. Peacekeeping missions are not meant to replace local protection structures, but they should rather aim to reinforce them. And I insist to reinforce them. One way to do this is by supporting community based early warning mechanism, which boosts the community's resilience and ability to prevent and respond to protection threats. For example, and I'm going to take an example from MONUSCO, but I'm, I'm sure some other colleagues will provide uh, uh, example from elsewhere. For example, MONUSCO has set up 87 operational community alert networks reaching civilians in more than 2,103 villages in the DRC. These networks transmit alerts on threats to civilians from North Kivu, South Kivu, Tanganyika, and Ituri, which usually these alerts trigger responses from different mission components. And I insist because I think one of the you talked about the uh, comprehensive approach to protection of civilians, um, that different components, these alerts are triggering response from different components and sections from the mission. Local authorities, so it's not just the mission, it's also the humanitarian actors, and it's also the other civilian stakeholders. And in that, I'm also talking about civil society organization as part 
of the response. In the relatively new frontiers, so I'm glad because I'm not saying something which is new because Ambassador, Ambassador Roscoe, you touch on it. Um, in the relatively new frontiers of technology applications in peacekeeping, we also find the use of unmanned uh, aircraft system, UAS, commonly referred as drones, very useful, actually extremely useful. And let me give you uh, an example which just happened this year. Earlier this year, MONUSCO used UAS to monitor a demonstration taking place in Beni, Eastern DRC. The information gathered in that instance promptly led to the conclusion that the crowd was not carrying weapons. So you see, facilitating a decision-making process in terms of a response. Subsequently, this assessment was shared with the security forces present in the area. So our force, FIB, choose the Police National Congolese to the FRDC, the Fourth Army uh, Republic Democratic of Congo, preventing the latter from engaging in any disproportionate reaction that might have escalated tensions and potentially caused civilian casualties among protesters. So very efficient in terms of crowd control, management of crowd control, using the information available to, to do that. We also use drones for imagery collection of population displacement and of illegal mining activities. Remember in our Security Council Resolution 2556, it is said that we are working to uh, help the country managing and changing the illegal exploitation of natural resources. So here is technology uh, being put at use for us with regard to uh, so illegal mining activities, fueling instability. So we are not doing this just to, for the sake of uh, mining because there is a link to insecurity and to the protection of uh, civilians who are at risk and particularly I heard earlier about children, child labor in Ituri province. This information has provided evidence to assess the situation and to inform unarmed protection and this is a key word, stabilization responses. Yesterday, our drones, and I'm talking now about the volcano eruption, were deployed to evaluate the extent of the damage created by the volcano eruption around Goma, helping us to better calibrate our response. I was in contact with the prime minister yesterday and again uh, yesterday uh, evening and again this morning. And one of the things is we continue through our drones to go to assess the road, the road, road between Ruchuru and uh, Goma, because this is part of the access of the traffic uh, for the delivery of assistance and also for uh, the provision of food and uh, everything else to the population in, uh, in Goma. And again, an helicopter from us went this morning to assess where we are in uh, the context of the lava uh, situation within the, uh, uh, the volcano. So these are some of the examples of ways where we are working. Now, we do this, and I think I said my first point was we have to make more communication about what we do already, addressing on um, uh, uh, pro protection approaches, but we also need now to invest, and this is my second point, investing in community resilience. Peace operations are inherently time bound. They are established with the expectation, and we all know this, that they will eventually transition and exceed the host countries. And in the context of DRC, this is precisely where we are. With this expectation in mind, a responsible approach to the protection of civilians must involve existing community-led strategies and frameworks and promoting the development of additional national and local capacities, and I insist on local capacities, to ensure the durability and sustainability of our protection efforts. 
clearly, if I take what is in 2056, uh, 2556 resolution for MONUSCO, it says it's going to be a gradual, responsible, and durable exit. So to arrive at that, the community level is going to be extremely fundamental. And I want to draw one particular uh, situation, which as, uh, 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 as we will say in French, a lot of ink has uh, come in, which is the UNAMID. When UNAMID left Darfur, the security environment was far from having been completely restored and the government of Sudan found itself in a political transition and an economic crisis that did not necessarily allow it to invest resources in the extension of state authority in its Western states. But the mission had started, and this is UNAMI, had started to support the training and empowering of youth to take charge of early warning responsibilities and protection tasks through a partnership with NGOs dedicated to this effort. In Jongle, this is another place, South Sudan, the long-term presence of NGOs within communities dedicated to organizing and training them in techniques designed to prevent and reduce sexual violence has delivered significant results. In these environments, we also need to invest in rebuilding, rebuilding the social structures and resilience of communities, allowing them to address and manage lingering physical protection challenges. And this again, coming back to the uh, uh, cloud, physical protection was very high, I think the bolder one, allowing them um, uh, to really uh, look at uh, the, a fully democratic and functional state with which will sometimes take a long way to come in. So in other words, if we have to balance between what we do at the national level at the provincial level, we need to make sure that the base is solid enough and this can only happen if we invest heavily at the community level. This is where of course, the integration of our missions planning with that of the agencies funds and program is key to the durability and sustainability of our efforts. And again, this is where I call upon the member states to always look into how well positioned are the agencies from that program to be in the places where they can invest and engage with the communities at the, uh, at the commensurate scale, which is required to avoid uh, what we say, which is if we go, we go in a durable way and we have to come back, then it means that agencies from that program have to have everything to do what they have to do. The rebuilding of society's ability to manage its own threat, and this is the end game. The end goal is for the communities to manage the threats which are uh, geared towards them. Uh, takes time and needs a one UN approach. So for me, the one UN approach, I know, the one UN approach is not just uh, uh, something uh, for having good papers, it's on the ground, it has to translate into how we uh, approach the communities in terms of a collective effort. And this is what I will call, it has to be a centerpiece to uh, our missions transition and exit strategies. And with you, the reason why I'm insisting on this is because DRC and MONUSCO is exactly at that time. And I'm sorry I've been a bit longer than expected, but thank you very much for your time and listening. Uh, SRSG, thank you so much. And that I would think everyone will agree was absolutely fascinating and I think really illuminating um, because it gave us both a sense of the comprehensive uh, nature of, of the approach which, which MONUSCO takes because of the comprehensive nature of the, of the challenge. Um, and also uh, a bit of a real time feeling that we have of all of the, all of the different um, 
uh, efforts which are going on from across the mission, military, police, civilian, working with the government, working with country teams. You spoke about joint patrols, uh, state institution capacities. You talked about the importance of the community being at the center and people being empowered. You talked about the role that technology can, can have to enhance uh, economic drivers and uh, of conflict and uh, the, the, the role of, of issues such as illicit mining maintaining humanitarian access. Uh, all of these um, and, uh, and more, I think, uh, will be reflected in the comments of our distinguished uh, panel. Um, and so uh, thank you so much, SRSG, for kicking, kicking off and setting the, the scene in that, in that keynote address. Um, let me now uh, turn to a video which we have uh, uh, prepared. Um, we asked peacekeeping personnel how they use unarmed approaches to protection of civilians. And this is, uh, this is what they said. Please have a listen. It'll give you a feeling for uh, the range of, of challenges um, that, uh, that uh, are being addressed. Um, and let me thank uh, SRSG Keita if she has to go in advance and wish her good luck and all of our colleagues good luck on the ground in a difficult situation in Goma. Civilians by creating and broadcasting radio programs calling upon combatants to disarm. I also warn the combatants on the consequences of human rights violation and recruitment of child soldiers. I protect civilians by supporting reconciliation and conflict management at the local level. So this includes, for example, um, promoting dialogue that addresses the triggers of violence facing civilians. I protect civilians by engaging with the armed actor to advocate cessation of hostilities in the conflict prone areas. I protect civilians by collecting and verifying grave child rights violations, namely those committed by armed forces or by armed groups. These evidence can later be used to prosecute those responsible for committing crimes such as sexual violence or recruitment of children. I protect the civilians by facilitating the removal of explosive threats from roads, schools, clinics and villages. I protect civilians by drafting reports, public reports on serious human rights violations and abuses and also on violations of international humanitarian law in view of holding, uh, ensuring that the perpetrators are held accountable. Je protège les civils en travaillant avec les communautés sur la réinsertion socio-économique des jeunes à risque et femmes vulnérables à travers les projets de réduction des violences communautaires afin que ces jeunes ne puissent pas adhérer ou retourner dans les groupes armés. I protect civilians by engaging the local communities to understand their fears and concerns. This information is used by MINISMA to respond to threats against civilians. I protect civilians by providing capacity enhancement trainings in the whole spectrum of conflict management to enable communities to manage their own conflicts and self-protect. I also facilitate community consultations, dialogues and reconciliation activities to help men back broken social fabrics and promote peaceful coexistence. I protect civilians by making sure the needs of women are met at every step of our DDR process, from when the women enter our demobilization centers to supporting them when they return back to their communities. I protect civilians uh, by ensuring the um, capacity building of uh, the local police through deployment of skilled UN police officers and also focusing on gender responsive policing. Nous apportons également un appui technique et logistique 
à la justice militaire en matière de répression des crimes graves. Together with my team, I protect civilians in three ways. First, we support national justice and corrections officials. Second, we're helping expand civic engagement on critical legal and policy reforms. And third, we're working with regional and international partners to help South Sudan transform its security sector and develop innovative programs to reduce community violence. Je participe à la protection des civils par la pu que nous apportons à la PNC, la police nationale congolaise, dans le cadre des réformes du secteur de sécurité, par le renforcement des capacités des agents de la PNC pour leur permettre d'être plus efficaces et plus professionnels dans leur mission première de protection des civils et par le monitoring que nous faisons de tous les faits de violation des droits humains. Thank you to the to the creators of that video. I think it was really great to hear from so many of our colleagues uh, working around the world and um, and reflecting on the various ways in which uh, they provide protection. Um, let me now uh, turn to our distinguished uh, panel. Um, we have a great panel with us today, um, and uh, I will introduce them all, um, and uh, then we'll, we'll hear we'll hear from them. Um, Mohammed El Amin Suef is the head of office uh, in Gao uh, in uh, the mission in Mali, Munizma. Mohammed uh, Mufdaw uh, Janath uh, Prince Aleji is the officer in charge, uh, uh, police uh, commissioner OIC, a senior UN police advisor in MINUSCA, CAR. Uh, and Lieutenant Colonel Rati Pusparini, uh, former military observer and staff officer of uh, Manuk, uh, Unzmis, and, uh, and Unifil. Um, let me uh, uh, invite them to, uh, to take the floor. Uh, after their uh, interventions, which I'll ask them to keep to uh, five minutes, um, we'll also hear uh, a, from a discussant, uh, Caroline uh, Kibos, who is the co-coordinator of the South Sudan Civil Society Forum, uh, and the youth representative to the reconstituted Joint Monitoring and Evaluation uh, Commission, the RJ uh, MEC in South Sudan. So a great panel, uh, different perspectives on, on this, uh, this incredibly important uh, challenge. Um, let me first give the floor uh, to um, Mohammed El Amin Suef, uh, the head of office in Gao. Uh, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure for me to take part of this uh, activity, said events. But uh, it's quite difficult to speak after an SRSG who is uh, knowledgeable and uh, been in most of all uh, the mission. Uh, talking about uh, 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 unarmed uh, approach to protection of civilian in UN peacekeeping. Uh, first of all, I know that uh, MINISMA, like uh, any other mission, establish uh, a POC strategy that has been built upon and is closely coordinated with the mission concept, including the military, the police concept of operation, the mission support concept and plans as well as other existing, existing relevant guidelines and analyses produced by uh, MUNISMA and uh, the humanitarian uh, protection cluster. So this had been done in consultation with uh, our humanitarian uh, partners, uh, mainly UNHCR and uh, OCHA. 
for sure, uh, we focus on uh, the three uh, stages of uh, uh, protection of civilian, mainly protection through dialogue, uh, provision of physical uh, protection, and uh, protection uh, uh, establishment of protective environments. Uh, talking about Mali is uh, really uh, difficult because uh, the dynamic is totally different from other dynamic. Uh, uh, I mentioned to you, David, uh, la, I mean, last Friday that I have been uh, in Darfur. The dynamic in Darfur, although it was challenging, but uh, totally different because there in Darfur, you have uh, the authorities everywhere, remote area, you have authorities, so they are controlling and they have the allied militia are supporting. So whatever is happening, the government is aware. In Mali, it's totally different because in Mali, you don't have those people out. For example, I'm in, uh, in Gao, which is uh, in sector est and the capital city, but out of the city, nothing. You don't have representative of, uh, of the government. You don't have representative of uh, even uh, the forces. Uh, and uh, on top of that, the mission, unlike uh, Darfur, doesn't have a presence, permanent presence everywhere, uh, which uh, I mean, is difficult for us to act and operate in terms of protecting of the civilian. Although we are trying to do whatever we can uh, do with uh, the limited uh, resources. Uh, talking about the, our strategies and the experience, if I take an area which is a very big area, the zone of three borders, I mean, you have Burkina Faso, you have uh, Mali, and you have Niger. Uh, most of the activities led by uh, the terrorist uh, armed group are led in that area. So then time to time you have intervention from uh, the, the French forces, Barkhane, and you have uh, uh, intervention of the G5 Sahel. But we as a MINISMA, we have to be there in the field, you know, and to be close to the population. And this is what we are trying uh, to do. For example, I mean, uh, two weeks uh, ago, with the support of uh, the British uh, contingent, I myself, I led a delegation, we went to test it which uh, is uh, far from Gulf, almost 200 uh, or more than 200 uh, kilometers. But there, the people are, I, I mean, uh, uh, permanently uh, targeted by armed group, by uh, the terrorist group, but uh, also by uh, people who are having uh, banditry activities in the region, because this is a main axis uh, that link uh, uh, access of supply, that link uh, Mali and uh, Niger. So most of the convoy are passing by in this area. So then we went there, it was uh, integrated mission. And this integrated mission is a kind of follow up of what we, what we have a statute here in the region, what we call uh, Colon Foreign. Colon Foreign, we advise the local authority, starting from the governor, and the, the mayor, the prefect, and said that let's go on the field. Because this is a region that has been vacated for almost, uh, I mean, since 2000, 2012. So then we said that let's go together. We will be there and we encourage the UN uh, uh, country team, agents and uh, uh, fund to join us. So then we go together. So then uh, we meet with the population and we discuss with them. We try to, uh, to understand their concern. Uh, what can we do for them? But the, the idea is uh, to, 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 to reinforce uh, the, 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 the state authorities in those remote area and to encourage them to come back. For example, most than 10 years, you don't have, uh, you don't have the, the presence of judge in this region. And how can we uh, 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 talk about uh, rule of law in this uh, locality if you don't have judge? You don't have a prosecutor. So that was uh, one of our, I mean, uh, idea to support them. Next to the city, you have uh, uh, the city of uh, Ansongo, which also is very important to ask. Uh, uh, I mean, this link between, uh, between uh, uh, Niger, uh, Gao, uh, also uh, 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 Kidal, uh, Menaka, the way to Algeria. So many activities are happening there in terms of, uh, of banditry, in terms of uh, uh, armed group uh, uh, activities, uh, terrorist activities. Uh, and on top of that, they discover uh, many sites of mining sites in, in those localities, in that locality. 
And uh, now you have many people who came from everywhere, from uh, Chad, from uh, Sudan, from uh, so which increased the number of uh, IDPs and uh, and refugees in uh, those localities. So then we went there. We said that you people, as Madame uh, uh, Madame Keta mentioned, you people, you should take the responsibility. And we are encouraging the authority to take the lead. We said that we are here to back up you. We are not here to replace you and to do on behalf of the, the government. So then we went there. We spoke with uh, the, the, the the civil society. We spoke with the local, the, 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 the few remain of the local uh, authorities in that uh, city. We, we advised them to establish a framework, which is uh, uh, the le cadre de concertation. And then within that frame, that uh, new structure, we said that uh, we can address all issues related to the security, related to the livelihood of the population. And uh, so at the end, we got more information and we said that, okay, in terms of security, we'd be able to support the force of defense and security in, the, in, in that locality. We will put some of the, uh, the checkpoints. We will put. Uh, we will. Uh, will. Uh, will. Will support uh, the the Malian forces by strengthening their camp. So then they will be able to act whenever is needed. And the population, instead of leaving women going, I mean, 15 kilometers looking for water, we said that we are going to implement a couple of. Uh, quick impact project in the Italia, so at least they will be safe. Also to rehabilitate the uh, offices of the prefect of the mayor, so then will encourage those who left their duty station to come back to their uh, area of uh, responsibility. And uh, this uh, already gave uh, some uh, result, good result, because uh, you managed to put everybody together, the civil society, the local authorities, the military, the police, and they are working in one, uh, structure and we are there to support them. So this is what we uh, we uh, we are doing. And uh, at the end, uh, we 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 can uh, observe and we can uh, see that there is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the what kind of the incident that used to occur in those uh, region now they are less because we put together without using force without. Uh, so we put together. The, the people to work together. On top of that, we have uh, also- uh, so, Mr. Swift, so, sorry to interrupt. I, 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 could I ask you kindly to wrap it up just because we're running low on time and I would like to pass yeah. to the next panelist, but thank you for yeah. these excellent remarks. I, I might ask you just to wrap up, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So then uh, on top of that, uh, the, the mixed, uh, as mentioned, Madame uh, Bintuketa, the mixed uh, and uh, joint patrol, so this is something, I mean, we are encouraged. We said that, uh, so then at least when we leave, there will be some uh, legacy. They know how we do collect the information and how we treat because uh, in terms of uh, law, humanitarian law, international law, and then whatever. So those people, they we are aware and they know, they see how we do act and what we are doing. So then uh, tomorrow, uh, when they take the lead after the exit strategy, so then they will be able to take uh, care of themselves. So once again, thank you very much. Five minutes is uh, it's tight. Is too much. It's a, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. And 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 it's clear to us, uh, 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 Mohammed, when 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 you're describing the range of challenges which you're facing in a situation where there's a vacuum of state authority, all of us when we walk out onto the street in a, in a, in our regular lives, we 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 count on the state to be there to protect us. And uh, and you're trying to work in a vacuum and. Uh, Thank you so much for bringing out the richness of that uh, of that work. Uh, we are just unfortunately caught with time, so I'm going to pass now the floor to um, the uh, police commissioner, uh, acting officer in charge, police commissioner, and senior UN police advisor, uh, Mohammed Muftu Janath Prince Alaji. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, Excellencies. Um... Dear seniors and principals, ladies and gentlemen, are you hearing me? Yes, can I we, proceed? Can do. we don't okay, see. Okay, you. okay. Uh, invited me to take part in this panel to address the issue of protection of civilians in armed conflicts. I fully appreciate the scope of this concern, um, which no longer escapes Security Council resolutions in most of the peacekeeping operations intervening in internal armed conflicts. Resolution 2572-2020 and UN poll corrupts referred conveyed UN poll to POC problematic 
in terms of um, reducing the presence on, and threat of armed groups through operational support to host state police and gendarmerie, as far as the car is concerned, and the use of urgent temporary measures. Based on that, UN Paul Minuska, um, that's um, um, in charge as the OIC, has established mandated strategies as well as rule of engagement of its forces in order to help the host government to fulfill its responsibilities for the park on a certain level. For what strategical objective in perspective? You and Paul have um, determined two strategical objectives. The main astronaut we are concerned is to maintain public order and protect the civilian population from physical violence, including sexual violence, to the extent of its means and the area of deployment. To what strategical priorities this objective conveys to Unipol 4? The only one that uh, I work on that, the only one I, I work with is to reduce the threat and presence of armed group by adopting a comprehensive, proactive approach and robust posture without prejudice of, um, to the fundamental principle of peacekeeping, UN Paul, part in POC. Based on our vision, objective, and uh, strategies, let's uh, foresee more challenges. Um, I know that um, you, you hear about a lot of challenges, but let me summarize some of the, um, the main challenges we are facing in this ground. Uh, the limited capacity of the host government and his uh, interior forces, security forces. The second one is the extent of the country, 624,000 kilometers square. The presence of armed groups and the issue of the child soldiers. The freezing process of the political agreement, which is pending now, and the slowness of the DDR process um, and USMS implementation. We mentioned also the violation of human rights, international humanitarian laws, and the so far by the conflicting parties. And finally, the almost total absence of the security, the state authority in the civil region. What to do to face effectively and efficiently all these challenges on the field of protection of civilians? We got some operational mechanisms that we put in place which works correctly, such as co-location, support, operational support, technical support, and logistical support, capacity building of internal security forces, political good offices, such as mediation to adopt a preventive approach as a first step and act at the last resort to physically protect civilians. Now, what our strategies generate on that field? What our strategies generate on that field is first, UN Paul built the capacity and support the host country police to protect civil life and property, maintain public order and security in full compliance, compliance sorry, with the rule of law and international human rights law. We also collect and analyze safety and security intelligence to contribute to the mission wide early warning mechanism. We established links between the whole state police and gendarmerie population as well, and build police capacity to create a pro protective environment. We also advise the whole state police on prevention and response. We also put in place by the support of um, uh, only farm women, uh, UN women, the green line we call 1325 to support any um, denunciation of um, any um, human rights violation, any uh, threat of um, over the um, um, civilian population. UN Paul also have uh, its own focal point in collaboration with uh, PIO um, um, to talk about POPs to the community leaders in Bangui and surrounding around this month and commune as well. Uh, we, I, I don't want to, um, to avoid the, uh, the number of the statistics of uh, uh, statistics we have conducted. But um, the main of that is uh, to let them understand the role of UN Paul in the pork field, and then let them to be a relay for other people to build trust and confidence 
between them and the local forces for the better protection. We also provided training on the gender-based violence for high school students in Bangui and for women leader association as well, association as well. UN Paul Focal Point worked mainly with the POC session here in Minusma, in Minusca, sorry, or with the uh, section Minusca Paul, um, POC session here closely on daily basis. And uh, we got the weekly protection working group with the DDR for Human Rights Division, the political division, and so on. Um, and the head of the, uh, the regions as well, with the aim to analyze the different offenses committed during the week and proposed possible solution. We also, at the political level, our focal point communicates with police and law enforcement agencies. Here is the mainly gendarmerie and police and PACA on the whole state at all level with a view to promote appropriate protection measure. We also gather and record exchange intelligence with over actors in the mission over human rights violation. And finally, we supported the mission effort to resolve local conflicts. Let me give you one example. We succeed uh, as part of this strategy to put in place in Bangui what we call with proud, let's say so, a proxy Pika Sync, Pika 5 model. It was a real experimentation of model of community oriented policing approach with the establishment of um, um, local forces unit, which never exists before, because the uh, in this area of Bangui, the group of self defense were strongly established, defying the authority of the state at any time. Now, we gain their confidence and build trust within them so that they accept minister to install one of these um, police station in this critical area in Bangui, as well as accept the cooperation with the establishment of the crisis management um, committee where the association of women, young people, communities, NGOs, civil society, and notables interact successfully to find the best solution for the security concern. Commissioner, what uh, thank to you. Could, I or, ask you to, uh, could I ask you to kindly uh, wrap up? It's fascinating, uh, but uh, we're running close on time. If I could just ask you to wrap up, thank you. Come again. I just, uh, if you could kindly wrap up your very fascinating remarks, uh, just because of the time, uh, we, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm the last up of my, uh, my intervention. Thank you, sir. Um, what to recommend? We um, encourage and strengthen the peace initiative on the ground. We encourage and strengthen all the reconciliation initiatives as well. We, we think that coordinating military operations in the ground, so that joint operation with force, UNPOL and FACA will also be the best way. We, we facilitate the action, of, the action of the experts on the rule of law and human, human rights in order to create the, pro, the protective environment for civilian population. We, est, we think that establishing a joint agenda with all the regular forces pending for a temporary occupation for the liberated area while the presence of the state authority asset itself therein. We have the, we, thank, we think that helping the whole, the whole state to, to restore its authority through the good stabilization approach. We continue, we hope that continuing advocacy between the government and the party to peace agreement and avoid the military approach. We also think that promoting the balanced DDR and EMS ongoing process could be a very good thing. And finally, we think that if we avoid or smooth out any divergence, divergence with the whole state on the main axis of UN mandate by selecting through regular dialogue and consultation, all agenda conflict that could hamper the effective and efficient implementation of municipal mandate. Thank you. Uh, that is all from my side. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, Commissioner Leggi. And uh, as we see, the challenges of the field include uh, some technical uh, issues. Uh, you weren't able to turn on your camera, but thank you so much for those points. And I note uh, the fact that seeing from the police perspective, the importance that you place on a comprehensive approach, you talked about community engagement in PK Sang, uh, a joint agenda needing to bring into account also work with the government and other elements of the mission. And I think that came through 
uh, really thank clearly. You. Thank you. Thank you for that, thank uh, you, that view. Thank you, sir. Um, let me thank pass you, now also the floor to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rati Pusparini, who is the former military observer and staff officer of Monuk, UNSMIS, and UNIFIL. So a very broad range of missions with uh, POC. Uh, uh, Colonel Ras uh, Pusparini, the floor is yours. Thank you, Director. Good morning, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me here to talk about my experiences in three mission. And yeah, as a, an arm approaches to protection of civilians in UN peacekeeping. So based on my experience there in Monuk at that time in 2008, uh, Dialogue and engagement with armed actors to mitigate harm, harm to civilians is uh, one of the key that we did uh, as a team site uh, Bunia at that time. So during, during patrol, uh, during collecting the information from the community, we found out that whenever women peacekeeper among the team, they're more uh, people from the village come to our place and then they share more information to us as a, as the Milop team. And, and it, it also happened when I was in uh, Syria. So we talk with the armed groups or the opposition groups at that time. And also we talk with the government. Uh, I was in home city at that time. And every evening we talk with the, the governor of homes while morning to afternoon, we spend our time talk with uh, the opposition groups. And, and we also talk with the community. So we, we engage them also. Uh, we ask about their, uh, I, of the idea, uh, their, their needs. So we, we share their, the information from the government to the opposition and from the opposition to the government. And we also see that the capacity building of actors uh, that also plays an important role in, in, in uh, protection of civilian where military personnel can engage in. So like uh, when I was in, in, in Congo, we went to a center for, for ex-combatant to be trained uh, as a national Armed Forces member in Beni area at that time. Uh, and, and again, Milop, as uh, the ears and eyes of the mission uh, should be uh, given more opportunity to, to go uh, around their area of responsibility. So uh, at that time, I was a bit jealous with the police because they can go and visit uh, IDP, but as a military member, we cannot go to that place. Uh, some examples then when I was in uh, what uh, MPT engagement is uh, the CIMIC team of Indonesian contingent. And also I saw the Korean and Malaysian. So they, they get uh, activities together with the community uh, for Indonesia. We, we, we are well known with the medis, medical team come to the people around the area of responsibility. So they treat the sick people there and also uh, school visit by, I think almost all contingent in, in, in Unifil doing that and uh, Taekwondo call, uh, training for uh, young boys and girls and also to the teenager from Korea and also engineering engineering uh, activity together with the community to build their uh, like uh, a small meeting room for the villagers. That's what happened in Unifil. Um, the challenges, when I was as a, one of the G3 ops officer in Monuk at that time, uh, one event, one no, incident maybe, we can say that, uh, one NGO came close to us as a Milop team and they just mentioned, uh, we will go to this village to send the logistic and, and we, in, we advised them actually, go to the 
contingent who has a, a, a security uh, capacity to to escort you to the area and they said no no we don't need we don't need any armed people around us we don't need any uniform people around us so uh, we we keep remind them uh, but this is very dangerous there but they said no no we can do that by ourselves okay uh, not long after that they came back to our post and they said yes we need this so the egocentric of each actor should be put aside if we talk about the uh, protection of civilian. So the community uh, engagement uh, really need to have all of the actors work together, uh, uh, think together what, the, what best for the community and, and just let the community to, to lead us. This is what we need actually. So this is not only the uniform people from military, uh, police or civilian NGO, IOs mm -hmm. or whatever, who think that they know better than the community, but let the community let, uh, tell us, this is what we need actually. Uh, so then uh, the, the decision maker from the strategic to the operational level can, can decide what, what would we do, what will we do for the community to protect them to give them more uh, confidence that they can protect themselves even from the any physical threat before they come to us to ask for our help uh, and if i can um, give suggestion uh, to to the to the higher level uh, please send more women peacekeepers to the uh, to the mission, let let us uh, work as the agent of peace and agent of change. Because once we are there in the field, young girls, uh, young boys, even the teenager or the, the young ladies, they, they will see us as a as a role model. Uh, it happened when I was in Congo. A small little a, a little girl is maybe around nine years old and she came to me and hugged me and she told me I want to be like you I want to be a, a military member so I can protect my country I can defend my country from anything I was just like wow then then I keep telling my junior especially I said uh, you are there as an ambassador of your own country as ambassador of UN uh, so you are the role model of the local people. So give the best from you. Let them see that uh, women as a part, actually it should be inclusive in all mission. So we have more women peacekeeper on it, more female engagement team like we have in uh, Congo now uh, from Pakistan, India and Indonesia who can engage more broad with, broadly with, with the local people. So we can, we can uh, give more, uh, we can get more intelligent information from people. And then based on this uh, intelligent information, then we can, we can uh, prepare our ops con for that. Excellent. Uh, I think that's, that's from me, uh, Director. Thank, thank you, Colonel, so much. Um, and, uh, you know, the points you raise both around the importance of having uh, women peacekeepers um, but but uh, to interact and 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 draw and engage with the community. But also, I, I took a lot from the points you also raised about uh, the importance of all actors leaving their egos aside in engaging um, together to cooperate together to protect civilians. And I think that's so important that the civilians are the ones that really need the protection, and we need to be flexible in our approaches to try to to meet that. Um, so a, a great richness of the of the of the points from the from the panelists. I'd like to now turn to our discussant, uh, Caroline Kibos, uh, who, as I said, is the co-coordinator for the South Sudan Civil Society Forum and also the youth representative uh, to the RJ Mech. Um, Caroline, uh, your thoughts, please, uh, for five minutes. Over to you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning. I, I believe it's morning in New York. It's evening in South Sudan. I'm required to speak about um, the civil society perspective on the UNMIS and armed approaches. 
So basically, uh, UNMIS is the UN mission in South, the UN mission in South Sudan, yes. So basically what UNMIS does is, um, uh, there is a, a whole range of things that it does, but when we talk about the unarmed approaches, uh, mainly it does direct engagement with armed forces. It also brings together communities. Uh, it does policing, and then it also supports initiatives that um, help with accountability and rule of law. So our perspective is that, yes, these are actually good things that it, it does, although we know that at some point, some of these things have uh, have um, have not actually uh, yielded the results that uh, maybe they, they were meant to yield. But what I would say is that the most, to me, or from a civil society perspective, is that the most effective one is um, bringing together communities, because uh, we know that uh, some of some of the approaches that uh, that uh, organizations have is that they do things on their own level, and then the communities are actually ignored. Yet when we want to do anything, we have to use an a bottom top approach. And in some of these approaches, and uh, some in, in the unarmed approaches that INMIS has been doing is bringing together communities. And then when you bring together communities, you find that actually these people have their own ways of conflict resolution or their own ways of protection. And then you can try to, and they have actually tried to build in, in those ways and, and, and give a good uh, modality. Uh, some of the challenges that we have in partnerships with, with um, civil society partnership with INMIS is one, there is a lot of bureaucracy with the with, uh, UN agencies, especially UNMIS, because we are talking about UNMIS right now. So by bureaucracy, what do I mean? I mean that uh, because when you're going to, when there are certain things that happen and you need to have a robust or you need to have quick fix or you need to go quickly to, to certain areas so that some of these issues are resolved. But then when you, you tend to partner with UNMIS, you find that they need certain things to first be in, in place before you can be given approval. When you get the support, you find that the need support has long, uh, has long gone. So that's what I mean by bureaucracy. For instance, if, if, uh, there is, uh, if there is information that something is about to happen in, in a certain area, so it's your duty to ensure that you protect these people by at least moving this certain group of people who are going to be attacked. But then if you're to, to partner with someone who is so bureaucratic and they need you to follow processes, to follow systems, I'm not saying that the systems are bad. I'm not saying that these processes are bad, but I'm saying that at least there needs to be some flexibility to allow certain things. To happen because certain things need some rapid. I've had a lot of sometimes you part before you even decide on modalities on how you're going to embark on on doing certain things. You find that these ideas of yours have been translated somewhere, even without you people sitting together. So some people have actually complained that yes, they have well, they have gone to partner with 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 UNMIS and shared ideas, and then before they could actually agree on certain things, they find that UNMIS has already gone ahead to implement these ideas without the, the other partner actually knowing. And then the bit whereby there is actually no funding from, from UNMIS, they want to do everything in kind. Yes, that's good, it's, it's very good, but at some point it's a challenge because some of these certain things need to actually be, be cashed out, not only giving in, in kind, but that's, that's not so much as, as of a problem, because in the end, at least even if they say in kind, they will actually be be happy to do everything in kind. What um, I would think that the international community should do, my recommendations that the international community and the, including the UN Security Council to do is, they should actually put support in community outreach. More support should be put in community outreach because um, We've been talking about community outreach, community outreach, but we've noticed that it's there is minimal support. That I want this minimal to to more more support should be added on the community outreach. We should also support um, dialogue as a method as a mean of uh, of uh, dispute resolution because sometimes just the bit of dialogue alone can help us um, go very far in protection actually and 
in actually prevention. So sometimes actually dialogue prevents some of these things because it's better to prevent than to, to, to come back later to say that you're going to protect. Then I would, uh, would also want um, more civilians to be deployed, more civilians than military. If we are using an armed approaches, we need to have more civilians deployed into this um, into these missions than than the military. Yeah, thank you. I hope I haven't used a lot of time. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kibos. No, uh, you were you were right on time, and um, uh, and very much appreciated for that. But also for bringing us a sense of of the reality of how it looks uh, from civil society trying to work with. Uh, uh, a large uh, peacekeeping mission. And I, I, I take your points about how uh, important it is for the UN to uh, both listen, but to engage with civil society. And I think you made the point of not running ahead with ideas which are just given, but then not really consulted and agreed upon. Um, and, uh, and the challenge of working with, uh, with the UN where, with in-kind and not, uh, not having fund funding support. Um, I think this question of a people-centered and more community-oriented approaches is, is central to uh, our discussion uh, today, as, as SRSG Kata said as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, I... uh, one, 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 there is one thing that I forgot to, to add. Uh, okay. yes, the, the issue of having at least someone we should have also in the UN Security Council, we should also have a farm member because we've all seen that most of these problems are in Africa, yet we actually do not have at least an African. I won't, I know it will take time to have someone particularly from South Sudan, but I would also call that at least someone from Africa because we noticed that most of these issues are in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you're not alone in saying that because in the chat, I think that uh, that point was raised as, as well, Ms. Kibos. Um, colleagues, I see that the time is relatively uh, short. I just want to check if there's anyone uh, from the audience who would like to uh, take the floor. Um, uh, please put up your hand or let me know. Um, but I would ask that if you do, uh, you keep your question or comment uh, very brief, as you can see. Um, and we have uh, Councillor Maria Bretta, who will be um, uh, who, who is the DPR uh, Deputy Permanent Representative AI. Uh, from the mission of Uruguay, who will be will be closing in uh, in four minutes. Would anybody like to raise a question or a comment at this point? Yes, yes, may. Uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, I, I did. Uh, the DPR of Ireland, Brian Flynn. Go ahead, please. Hello, I am Adit Mishra from India. Uh, okay, uh, go ahead, please. Uh, Yes. Yes. UN has any any initiative to make the standard of needy peoples in the in the Xinjiang province of China? Uh, China abuses human rights in China. Thank you for that question. Um, I don't believe uh, I don't believe we have the expertise to answer that, um, and I don't myself know of any initiative uh, at the moment on that that issue. Um, uh, but thank you, thank you for the question. I see also uh, Brian Flynn, the DPR of Ireland. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, David, and thank you to our organisers. I think this has been a really important uh, meeting, shining a light on on the aspect of unarmed approaches to the protection of civilians, which was really important. And I think when I was listening this morning, what really struck me was how this is about um, a comprehensive approach uh, to peacekeeping and peace building and an inclusive approach um, and ensuring that we involve people on the ground, we involve people at a community level in, in the work that's been done. A people-centered approach is something I think that we heard repeatedly. Um, and it struck me, um, and SRSG, Keita also, uh, and others have made this point, um, the important role these approaches can play, particularly when we look at transitions, um, that this is really uh, central that we bring this in here. I know we probably won't have time to go back to the panelists, so that would have been a question, um, maybe if people wanted to expand a little bit on 
on how these approaches can help when it comes to, to transitions and building um, sustainable peace. There'll be another event on that that we're involved with on Wednesday. But again, to thank the organizers and to thank our speakers today. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Flynn, um, and indeed an important issue. Uh, apologies, it's uh, I suppose as the moderator, it's for me to apologize that we're running out of time, um, but we will have chance in POC week and there are a number of events coming up uh, to explore these issues more. And I think maybe it's only natural that on our kickoff discussion on POC, uh, there's such a, a large amount to exchange. And I think all of our speakers uh, could, have, could have gone on for, for longer. But I, I do believe we're probably out of time um, to deal with, uh, with uh, uh, going back to the panel um, as we are now uh, four minutes before time. Uh, and so we need to uh, draw this very rich and very informative discussion to a close. I hope uh, if we throw up the word cloud now, we would see uh, new words coming forward uh, to, to add to, uh, to those that are already there or, or, or to uh, enlarge the importance of all of the ranges of unarmed uh, civilian protection, unarmed approaches by our military colleagues and our police colleagues, uh, uh, working with the government, working with civil society, the role of civil society, and all of those, uh, those voices that we saw from the video uh, showing how many different ways in which uh, peacekeeping missions are trying, not always succeeding uh, to, uh, to address this really challenging issue. But let me pass the floor now uh, with many thanks again to our organizers and all of the panelists and our keynote speaker, SRSG Keita. Uh, let me pass the floor for closing remarks uh, to Councillor Maria Beretta, who is the Deputy Permanent Representative uh, at Interim for the Mission of Uruguay to the UN. Councillor, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Um, on behalf of the Mission of Uruguay to the UN, it has been an honor today to share this side event within the framework of POC Week. Uh, we think this is the first of a week that is going to be very fruitful for all the actors committed to this cause. Uruguay has promoted discussions of the consent of POC and supported the most recent policy on POC of the Department of Peacekeeping Operations that updates its definition at the three tiers of POC action, which include the non-military approaches that we heard of today here. And finally, uh, to our keynote speaker and to all the panelists, we thank you for your efforts to attend from different time zones and places. It's your experience on the field which motivates us to continue working toward this common goal. Finally, I could not uh, finish without thanking and acknowledging the work uh, and constant support of TPO and of course, also the missions of the United Kingdom and Indonesia for being such a good partners in this initiative. We thank all the attendees and count on us to continue working together. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Beretta and uh, for the continuing support of, of Uruguay. So uh, I think uh, it, it falls to me to draw this meeting to uh, a close and wrap up. I do note that there are a number of very interesting comments and questions uh, in the chat uh, relating to the issue of when the UN is too late after early warning responses happen, relating to the question of when physical threats come not just from armed militias, but from the government, uh, relating to the question of how we work with NGOs and civil society organizations uh, and more. And all of these are really critical questions. They're challenging ones. Uh, peacekeeping missions do not go to places which uh, have guaranteed success. They go to places where there are huge challenges and where very often uh, we continue to, to fall short, but we need to uh, find ways to improve our, our, our approaches, uh, work with partners and ensure that we meet the demands and needs uh, of the people on the ground. And, and, and I would insist on that last point that when we consider protection of civilians, we really need to put the civilian at the center, the civilian who is under threat and to ask how we as the UN, the international community, the host government, and indeed any armed actors on the ground can live up to our responsibility to protect them. Um, and with that, perhaps uh, I'll say thank you again to our organizers, um, to uh, Indonesia, to the UK uh, and to Uruguay. Uh, and wish you all a very uh, successful and interesting POC uh, week. Thank you all. Bye-bye.